Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features part two of a two-part review and commentary on Excalibur Special Edition, otherwise known as The Sword is Drawn, which was published by Marvel Comics in December 1987. So please do make sure that you watch part one of this video before uh, watching, obviously, this one. So at the end of the previous video, we got to this point where Rachel uh, pops into a fancy dress party as it turns out and the war wolves arrive and she's confused and um, attacks uh, the war wolves uh, who are agents of mojos and uses her tk against them and she flings one here through a wall and what she sees on the other side is that she is not just on a sound stage of mojos but rather in London, England. So a pretty cool sequence here. And that is what she popped into a masquerade fancy dress benefit today. So let's continue uh, with the uh, fight here. So the war wolves are tasked with bringing her back to Mojo World and they race out after her and uh, follow her across the street. Funny little bit here with these two punks saying, London's getting totally weird, man. Core lummy, what ugly dogs. As they race after Rachel, who goes down into uh, one of the underground uh, stops and uh, she goes aboard the, uh, the underground tube and uh, one of these uh, werewolf dogs ends up knocking his jaw off the closed door, but he goes after her on the back of the train, smashes his way in, and then she just uses her phoenix powers against him and says, you don't understand, Warwolf. I'm free and no one's ever going to cage me again as he falls down on the tracks. And so Rachel turns around and she overhears with her telepathy the thoughts of the passengers. See her, what she did, Lord of Mercy, Muty, Monster, Hurtles, Wish I Could, Run Away, Hate Her, Smash Her, Do That. So she recognizes that they're afraid of her and with good reason. And here are these werewolves mourning the death of their um, comrade and their howling is heard here uh, by Gatecrasher and Technet. And she says, uh, well, her uh, teleporter here, the lizard says, I sense the star child, which is how he refers to Phoenix. And Gatecrasher says, Splendid, we've spent quite long enough on this pathetically primitive orb already. So they're hunting Phoenix to bring her to the Omniversal Magistrix, uh, Opal Luna Saturnine. And then we switch back to a certain lighthouse on the west coast of England. And here we have uh, Brian Braddock, who has been uh, mourning uh, the death of his sister, Betsy, his twin sister, who, along with the rest of the world, believes died in Dallas, Texas with the X-Men. Um, and here he's been picked up and thrown into uh, the sea by a Nightcrawler. And he, this uh, wakes him up from his drunken stupor and he finds Nightcrawler here in the kitchen making coffee and Brian says someone tried to kill me hardly says Kurt you're doing well enough on that score by yourself what's the meaning of this uh, Captain Britain asks Nightcrawler simple I need you awake and sober and I'm not in a polite mood and I'm not in a mood to be polite about it that's the explanation if you wish an apology Herr Braddock earn it great coloring on this page uh, by Glennis Oliver as well Let's continue. So the conversation here between Kurt and Captain Britain is uh, fairly direct. Uh, Captain Britain here still feeling uh, sorry for himself and uh, despairing. And Nightcrawler says to him, well, he says to Nightcrawler, we're supposed to be heroes, but we never really make things better. We have no lasting effect on people or the world. So interesting response here from Nightcrawler in relation to that. He says, the devil you say, when I say I'm a hero, I mean it in jest. I haven't the right to truly call myself one and you have even less. All I am is a man trying to live life as best he knows how and be true to what he was taught. 
Those beliefs got my sister killed. Yeah, and my dearest friends with her, my family, mein Gott. Sometimes all I yearn for more than anything is to have been given the chance, the privilege of standing with the X-Men and sharing their fate. It isn't fair they're dead. It's far worse that I remain alive to grieve for them because it's more pain than I can endure. But I am alive, Brian Braddock, he says. And here he says, and I must remain true to myself as to their memory. If that is more than you can handle, Captain Britain, I'm sorry to have troubled you. And Brian says, you don't understand. You don't actually know what it's like to die. No, perhaps not. But do you, Herr Braddock, have even, have even the slightest idea what it's like to truly live? And I like this bit here where he uh, almost runs after him and says, wait, you blur blue furred goblin <laughs> you've no right to judge me and this is because he has memories occurring to him memories lying broken and bloody more rag doll than man watching the ex executioner's hand rise the gun flash so afraid and then waking up reborn whole and this is in reference to the um alan moore alan davis storyline where he was killed by the fury but never healed knowing death must come again haunted by the certainty that this time will truly be the end terrified by the fear that it won't and interesting here to see a little bit of continuity when nightcrawler pushes captain britain up against the wall of the kitchen it breaks the plaster on the wall and we see uh the mark of that uh behind his back here as well so alan davis paying good attention to continuity uh of the uh, surroundings in uh, this particular sequence as well. And then the scene switches to London as we move towards the climax of the story. And uh, we have uh, Rachel walking down this foggy side street, uh, deserted, and she thinks, scrounge some clothes to call my own. Question is, do I have a place to go with them? I'm the prodigal girl who ran out on the X-Men when they needed her most. And that's in reference to her choices in Uncanny X-Men 209. I betrayed their thus, trust, she thinks. Serve me right if they slam the door in my face. No sense moping, lost and lonely, sob. Sorry for myself. The X-Men are my family. I have nowhere else to go. So she doesn't seem to know that they died in Dallas. She hasn't got that news yet. And here, again, in um, some foreshadowing, she's looking into this fantasy fair uh, bookshop and seeing advertisements for Sword in the Stone, Knights of the Round Table, The Once and Future King, uh, Mort Arthur and James W. Barr and uh, Brian Boland's Camelot two, uh, 3000 as well. And uh, then suddenly she catches sight of a reflection of TechNet um, in the window and she's grabbed by body bag. And again, this is just great the way that Alan Davis illustrates this. So he takes her into his body and then she pops out on his back and uh, great sound effects by Tom Orzikowski as well gulp erp blorch and then we've got uh, gatecrasher saying okay they've done jobs done uh, she says uh, reached your limit to body bag not to worry now that we have our prize we can dispense with the other two that's Megan and Kitty Pride and no that does not mean dinner we'll leave them here and they're getting ready to go but suddenly they're attacked by these war wolves that have been um, waiting to ambush them. Uh, well, uh, Phoenix first and foremost. And so now we have TechNet going up against the war wolves. And this is pretty brutal. This war wolf here basically sticks his paw right through Pharaoh's chest. And Gatecrasher says, oh bother. I, should, I never should have kept Pharaoh on the payroll after his warranty expired, so he's dead. And this lizard teleports her, goes and hides from the fight. Look at this, she crushes one of the war wolves' heads. And up here in the shadows, this is really cool, we've got Nightcrawler observing what's going on and thinking, what a sight. Almost a shame to interfere, but the prisoners might get hurt in the crossfire. Nice thing about Rachel, she broadcasts such a powerful and distinctive bio pattern that the portable Cerebro sensor pack I brought with me from Morale led me right to her. So that's how he is here. And he think, continues to think, I figured Gatecrasher would catch up sooner or later. Pity I didn't have a chance to warn Rachel, but this is my chance to make amends. And then he drops down on Body Bag's head and uh, uses, this is great in this sequence here, 
uh, use a Trix, a Warwolf, to slash at the back of these uh, sacks on body bag, which frees uh, Rachel, Megan, and Kitty. So here they uh, slide out onto the cobblestones of the street. And Rachel, because she's just been um, taken up by body bag, uh, hasn't been 100% affected by the narcotic that keeps captives tractable uh, uh, as Nightcrawler uh, infers and thinks here. And then he asks Rachel for a hand and she says, Nightcrawler, Warwolves immune to my side powers. Okay, so that's interesting. So she can use her TK on them, uh, but not her side powers. And, the, and then Gatecrasher grabs one of the Warwolves again, throws it away and grabs Nightcrawler because he escaped from her um, in uh, the first half of uh, the story. And she says, you needn't fear those beasts tearing you limb from limb, that pleasure I reserve for myself, but look behind you and it's Captain Britain who's sobered up and gotten into his costume and says to her, I strongly suggest Gay Crusher that you restrain yourself and reconsider this particular operation or you'll answer to me. And she says, you forget, my dear captain, the technet has seen you in action. And so he's grabbed by uh, this guy here. Um, I don't, I haven't got his name to hand and is thrown into uh, the window here of one of the shops. And then Gatecrasher tosses Nightcrawler into one of the Warwolves and she orders this technet member ring toss to uh, uh, capture Rachel before she flies off. So this one uses her powers to bind Rachel, but Kitty has w woken up from um, uh, the drugs, uh, uh, the organic drugs of body bag, and she's hoping to redo the trick from the first half of the story and from the dream and help Ray phase free. But she's caught by this guy, Joy Boy. And um, in the narrative uh, captions, we get an explanation of his particular powers. But as Kitty lunges forward, Joy Boy takes her fondest desire to be solid once more and makes it rude reality as she turns into this massively obese blimp here. Um, and great uh, dialogue from Claremont here, Blix, Gerbil, Vooty, uh, fun stuff and uh, fun cartooning by Davis as well, as she plops on the ground. Let's continue with the story. So this melee between the three factions continues. And then we have this other character, China Doll, who has the power to turn uh, anyone she touches to a prettier size, as she says here. And she'll wear this Warwolf as a glitter bangle. Megan wakes up feeling slimy inside and out, but she sees that Brian's in trouble, so she races to help. But Waxworks, one of the members of the Technets, uh, touches her with one of his tendrils, and then her body loses all firmness. So this distracts Captain Britain, which uh, leaves him open to Scatterbrain, whose power is once she touches him, uh, she all his neural synapses fire at once, so he's knocked out. So here's Nightcrawler struggling with the Warwolf. And this is great, or this is interesting because here really is the origins of Excalibur as a team. We're being slaughtered, Nightcrawler thinks. Hardly surprising, I suppose. The opposition are functioning as teams, the Warwolves and Technet, we aren't. Time for that to change. So he tosses this Warwolf at a Ring Toss and then they both fall into uh, Waxworks and this gives Rachel a, an opportunity to uh, free herself of the energy rings. And then she attacks Joy Boy and he flies off and that frees Kitty from his control. And now Nightcrawler knocks China Doll into Gatecrasher. She shrinks from the touch and then Kitty's able to suck Great Gatecrasher in the jaw. As she thinks here, taking all my concentration to stay solid, body will hurt tomorrow from the strain, but boy, is this worth it. So at this point, Gatecrasher thinks it's time to teleport away. So the whole of Technet teleports away and the Warwolves slink away 
to lick their wounds, mourn lost comrades, regain strength and plan for another chase, a happier day. And indeed they do continue to go after Excalibur in the ongoing series. So now we have the aftermath of uh, the fights here on the streets. So there's quite a lot of property damage and we've got a, um, a happy reunion of Captain Britain and Megan here and um, Nightcrawler checking on Kitty and then Rachel getting an idea. She goes back to the fantasy fair uh, window and looking at this model of Excalibur, the sword in the stone. And she says, one thing about us X-Men types, you can always tell where we've been, if not from the mess, then from the faces of the innocent bystanders, which she remembers from the Metro, caught in the crossfire, whose homes and lives have all been wrecked and yet. Um, so she's thinking, she's getting an idea, and then there's the reunion here, a proper reunion with Nightcrawler and Kitty, not a dream. And uh, Kitty asks her, Rachel, is it really you, warts and all? bit worse for the wear, I'm afraid. We believed you dead, you forgot, Fuzzy Elf. I'm Phoenix. If I die, it's only to be reborn, hopefully better and brighter than before. So this is a reunion that many readers will have been one, um, waiting for all the way since Rachel disappeared at the end of Uncanny X-Men 209. So a tearful reunion and a happy one. And here we come to the conclusion of the story. Another night after the mess in London has been tidied up and explanations made to the appropriate authorities atop the Scots Highlands. So we've got them telling stories, old stories around this campfire. We've got Kitty here referencing Uncanny X-Men 141. So Professor Xavier spends weeks programming the danger room for my trial session and I walk through it untouched with my eyes closed. And we've got Nightcrawler, interestingly here, referring to an episode from the backup story to classic X-Men number four. Wolverine challenged me to walk down the main street of Salem Center, undisguised in my natural shape. So there they are sharing stories. Your turn, Rachel, says Kitty to her. Any memories of the X-Men you'd care to share? And interesting here, this detail of um, Davis's where Rachel is using her TK to hover above the ground. Nice little uh, storytelling characterization detail here. Not the kind you mean, Kitty, she says. Not the kind I can trust. So this is an interesting bit. The facts in my head, they're so jumbled up. I don't know anymore what's real and what isn't. What actually happened, what's a lie. So we're never gonna find out what went on in her time in Mojo World after being tempted there by Spiral. But that doesn't matter because the clutter doesn't affect my emotional realities because in turn, Perhaps, in turn, because the phoenix, by nature, relates, responds better to feelings than rationality. I know who I am, who I care for, who I don't. That's what matters. The rest I can take or leave. Speaking of leaving, says uh, Brian, it's awfully late. Time, I think, to follow everybody else's example and return home to bed. And here's Rachel's idea that she was pondering uh, at the shop front window. Is that it? Pack up, call things quits, and go our separate ways. We accomplish what we set out to do, says Brian. Now, while I deal with the war wolves, the rest of you can go on with your lives. What about those lives? How are we supposed to live them? I don't understand, Rachel. What do you mean? The dream, Captain Charles Xavier's dream, of a world where all Earth's children, mutants and otherwise, live together in peace and harmony, where people are judged for who they are, not what they look like or how they're born. That's why he created the X-Men to exemplify that dream. Are you saying simply because the X-Men are dead, we're supposed to give it up? And it's interesting here, we have the formation of this new team that is forming around staying true to Professor X's original dream at the same time as the X-Men who are not dead, but who are uh, living covertly in the outback of Australia and attacking covertly their enemies um, have somewhat, not, not quite abandoned Professor X's dream, but taken a more, a, like a darker interpretation of it. So here we have um, a return to the lighter interpretation of Professor X's original dream. And this is uh, Kitty's response. The dream we had, Nightcrawler. Remember, back before 
this crazy caper began in it rachel said to me when the reality no longer exists exploiters can take the legend and make it whatever they want good or bad so nightcrawler says are you suggesting we take the x-men's place nobody can do that says rachel but king arthur had a dream too of a world where might served right instead of subjugating it his knights of the round table were the agents of that dream and his sword excalibur the symbol of it so we see the sword here he died the table was destroyed his knights mostly slain yet the dream survived they became legend and the sword the means of keeping the legend alive and vital through the ages the x-men thought enough of professor xavier's dream to offer up their lives is it so much to ask that we fight to preserve it the sword excalibur represented hope it was light in the darkness of fear and ignorance and hate do we want have we the right to snuff it out and great imagery here in the fire king arthur excalibur the phoenix effect and the darkness pointing her question about snuffing out the fire of professor x's hopeful dream great coloring on this page the blue of the night by glenn soliver i've run my whole life says rachel i can't remember a time when i wasn't afraid i let people tell me what to do it's easier that way you know saves you from having to take responsibility for anything well i'm tired of running i want to take a stand because if i don't then maybe i better let the war wolves carry me back to the make-believe slave world where i belong a world of illusion and artifice where whatever sells best gets the glory whether it's truth or lies so interesting commentary by rachel and applicable today as much as it was in 1987 i think so nightcrawler responds and says myself i stand for truth and stand by you and megan is uh, moved by the speech rachel's life sounds much like mine brian i won't have anyone else endure such horror i like this dream it's worth fighting for how about you nightcrawler says to kitty so interesting the layout here rachel in the center the fire behind her megan inviting captain britain nightcrawler kitty last page there we go what the heck count me in she says with all my heart brian responds and there we have it the formation of a new x team and so with laughter and transcendent joy the the dream is reconstructed and excalibur that most ancient and noble blade once more redrawn the beginning so i do hope that you enjoyed Here's widget on the background doesn't feature in this but he will in upcoming upcoming issues of excalibur i hope you enjoyed this review and commentary on the sword is drawn if you did please like it in youtube and if you haven't done so already subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this